As 2015 gets underway, how should we assess the seven and a half month old Modi government? That's the key issue I shall raise today with a man they consider the economic inspiration of the government, Columbia Professor Jagdish Bhagwati. Professor Bhagwati, let me start with a very simple question. This government is yes. seven and a half months old. You've been observing it fairly closely. What assessment have you come to of this government's performance over the last half year? My view is not that of a shock therapist saying you should do everything instantaneously. Like even in the 91 reforms where my own very dear friend Manmohan Singh was part of the team which was pushing for the reforms. My, my sense in politics, particularly democratic politics, it's very hard to move very fast uh, because you've got to negotiate a number of minefields. So what I look for is whether the, the speed at which somebody is going is reasonable uh, and does not actually lead to tip, tipping over. Like, I mean, if you try and turn a ship around too fast, you could, in fact, wind up like the Korean ferry disaster. So by that standard, do you think the speed and the direction the Modi government is following is right, or is it I slow? I think it has been astonishingly good, because the trouble about Indian culture, as you know, is this infinite patience. And what you want is someone who is able to say decisively, that's where I want to go. Now, what has he been doing on, uh, in terms of um, that kind of decisiveness? I think he's trying to scale up uh, as rapidly as he can, and which is a reasonable amount of, amount of speed, uh, foreign investment, in, inward flow, flow of foreign investment, and trade. Now, I think this is part of the Gujarat DNA. I, it, ethnicity does matter, and your own experience does matter, you see. Let's go back to the starting point of this government and right. then see how we work ourselves forward right. till we come to 2015. There were some who were disappointed with the budget when it was presented in July. Yes. They thought it didn't send out a clear enough message about reforms right. and they thought it didn't tackle awkward, difficult issues such as retrospective taxation effectively. Right. Do you share that concern or do you think that was a mistaken view? No, I, I partly share it, but you see, one, we've gotten stuck traditionally, uh, I'm speaking like an economist, which I am, with having major reforms done through the budget. It's a very unusual thing. Except it's the Indian tradition, yes, even though I Mr. Know. Jaitley's but, trying to change it. But I think that is what, uh, I think what you're going to get it's a series of tr transformational changes, small ones, but adding up. So it is a continuous process in which the Prime Minister is engaged in my So view. the fact that the budget in July didn't announce major reforms doesn't put you off because reforms can happen at any time during the and year. And they are happening, actually. Uh, well, I'll come to the reforms in a moment's time. Right. What did happen in the budget, and for many this was a surprise, is that Mr. Jaitley as finance minister accepted the challenge of a 4.1% fiscal deficit target set by Chitandram. Now, yes. looking back, do you think he was right to do so, or should he have actually used that opportunity to clear up the messy figures Mr. Chitandram had left behind? It's very difficult to be tough on the budget when you just come in, uh, in my view. Pe people want to take it in their stride. And I think it was a mistake, in my view, on Jaitley's part, to in fact just simply take over uh, what in fact was not sustainable. Today, I think in the budget which will be forthcoming, I think he's got two things going for him. One is the oil prices collapsed. Now, what does that mean? It, it means that the subsidy bill half of it can be, again, to take arbitrary numbers, half of it can be used to uh, can be taxed off and then can be used to address a deficit. The other half would be something you give to the consumers and that is politically also advisable. Secondly, I think he also can benefit from the fact on the environmental front because this has left uh, people like Putin in deep trouble. But you know, I want to go back to the point you made that you think it was a mistake to have accepted Mr. Chidambaram's 4.1% target. At this the was time. Enough. This was the time At to the actually time. clear up the mess. Now, if you look at what's happened since then, no doubt the oil price has come down, so right. the subsidy burden has come right. down, and that right. will help him. Right. But at the same time, and this is the sad part, revenue realization is a lot slower than the government had anticipated. Right. Disinvestment is talked about, but it hasn't happened, and you've only got two months left now for it right. to happen. Right. And as a result, there is a real fear that the 4.1% target will not be met. Now, if he fails to meet it come 
the end of February mm. when he announces his budget, mm. Mm. will Mr. Jaitley be in trouble? Will the world be understanding? Or will a very worrying message have been sent out to investors? Uh, I personally think that the rate at which money comes in is, is a complicated factor. But broadly speaking, uh, when the economy has picked up on its growth, which is, I think it has to some extent, not as much as we would like, uh, because it had gone into a real tailspin. Uh, and it had, I don't think the Manmohan Singh government was particularly responsible for it, because as soon as you have corruption charges being traded, people sure. don't clear but but, but you're saying not. to me that the rate at which money comes in can pick up in the last two months and I, so revenue realization which looks low not, could not, pick up substantially but not in two months i mean anybody's guess but i would say in the next six months but the next the six months revives, means that he's then crossed the deadline for the fiscal deficit and the end of year yeah but but i think is again if you look ahead and not make up your mind on the immediate short run you can say look it's going to change so if come the 31st of March. Right. And given the fact that already the fiscal right. deficit is running at 99% of the target for the year, and that right. was by November. Right. If come the 31st of March, he misses the target, and it goes from 4.1 to 4.5 or 4.6, right. Right. and hopefully not higher. Right, right. Will that worry international investors? I don't think so, because I think people are looking at two different things. One is that the market is opening up. We want to get in on the ground floor, because you know, as soon as they see India is actually moving up scale on, on, on an open market, they're not going to hesitate. So because the if, they, if, if I hesitate, the other guy is going to get So in. the opportunity for investment and to make money in India will be greater than the distraction or the detraction of the fiscal deficit of target deficit, being missed. Exactly. And then now as far as the deficit is concerned, they will look at also the, the tough reality, which is that we are going to benefit <coughs> from the oil price decrease, and which, which will help to us. Uh, which will make deficit meeting in later years easier. Yeah, in the rest of the year or so. And two, remember, we also have to do environmental uh, commitments, right? I mean, the world is moving into that. Because Putin, Russia has now got resources which are unemployed. Uh, it is in a position where we, oh, we are in a position where we can actually pick up things like the 12 nuclear plants at, but for a song. Provided we for, can get the nuclear liability law into a position which is not, not a deterrent. Yeah, but, but Putin doesn't care about that. Well, he does have concerns, may not be as strongly expressed as the French and but, the Americans, but, but he does have concerns. overwhelming necessity but, but, but for come him. Back, come back to the economic handling of right. this government. Let's come to Putin later. Right. After the budget, there were a spate of announcements, new policies from the Modi government. I'm talking right. about things like Come Make in India, the right. Prime Minister Jandan Hyojana, and then as of the 1st of January, he's using the Aadhaar scheme very effectively to yes. ensure that money remittances for right. LPG subsidies right. are actually paid to people's accounts. Right. Are you as an economist happy with those schemes and those policies? Do you think they're a clear indication of reform? Yes. Or do you think it's just intent? and publicity rather than change on no, the ground. No, no, I, th I think this is very clearly something he's, he's wanted to do. Uh, and I think the other movement, if, it, if you apply just to remittances from abroad, that takes it into a different arena. But the point is, it, it goes into the budgetary question also directly because we were using the Enriga scheme to be to to be giving conditional cash transfers, okay? But I don't think Aadhaar is being used for Enrega at the moment. It may no, happen later on. Uh, uh, the reason why, but but the, it's being put into place. Uh, and one of the problems, of course, I mean, on the downside is that Enrega. One of the problems with it is that politicians were using it to di divert lots of funds. So actually, and well, hopefully, when Aadhaar is used for Enrega, that diversion won't happen. But that is still but, further but, down but, the road. But that's why it will. That's why Enrega won't be reformed, in my opinion, because the minister from Haryana, who is clearly but into come, politics, move away from Enrega. Come back to come make an India. The Prime Minister Jandan Yojana. How do you view those schemes? Is come make an India in your eyes something that's actually changing reality on the ground, or is it simply? A good slogan. It's a good slogan, but it's also a bad slogan. In why is the, it a bad slogan? Uh, it's a bad slogan. It, uh, let, let me say why it's a good slogan. Because it, it fits into invest here and make things here. Right? So it is part of the 
Uh, the general sense of we welcome foreign investment. And why is it a bad but slogan? It's a bad one because the notion that you should have things produced in India is, goes back to the import substitution policies. And this is something he shares with Obama. Obama also works And as Raghuram Rajan way. pointed out, this notion also seems to believe that the world outside is still capable of importing from India the way it could have done 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. The world has changed and therefore we may not be able to sell as much to the world outside I, as we could have earlier. But you see, that's ex what we used to call export pessimism. I think Raghu for once is wrong on something uh, because I think the way countries like China broke into the international markets was not buying into this. Or they took it at the expense of other so countries the which were hesitant. So the potential to grow by exporting, which is what it the remains. Prime Minister's make in India actually hinges on, it, it is, is still there. It is still there. You don't need to substitute and make in India with make for India, as Raghuram right, Rajan was suggesting. No, I think he's wrong, definitely. Because that, that's exactly when I was in the Planning Commission in 1961. I'm as old as that. And so at that time, we were actually buying into this argument, saying we couldn't possibly export So there more. is enormous potential for growth as a result of an export first or an yes. export dominant philosophy. Right, right. And the other thing which bothers me about manufacturing in India is that uh, something which I think, again, many of us have written about, which is that what, what we want is not manufacturers as such. Uh, what we want is labor-intensive manufacturers. Because so that there are jobs for people who don't have adequate employment and at so the moment. And so for all the expenditure we made, we got less bang for our buck compared to countries in the Far East which were using labor-intensive approach. Let's, let's at this moment and pause and ask whether the reforms Mr. Modi has put into place yes. actually will enhance and help A, make for India and B, the creation of labor-intensive manufacturing. Now the first reform, and it happened just a couple of weeks ago, was the Land Acquisition right, Amendment right. Ordinance. He suddenly made it easier and simpler in certain <coughs> specific categories for industrialists to acquire land, but he hasn't made it cheaper. And many industrialists say that already land is amongst in India is amongst the most expensive in the world. If now you have to pay four times to farmers what the actual notional price is, it might be prohibitive for industry. So does he need to tackle not the easier part, but the cheaper no, part? No, that part is simply lobbying. I mean, well, I don't see why Tata should have been subsidized in any way <clears throat> in Bengal. Um, they, they should buy land at the, at the price going prices. But absolutely, the going price but is the not the price <clears throat> the land acquisition bill says. The land acquisition says you buy it four times more than the going price. So that's the point I'm asking. No, Industrialists but, but say the world price is not necessarily what you compare local non-traded goods prices with. Because these are not traded. <clears throat> so if your scarcity is such for land, that it must be higher priced, then, then you have to pay the higher price. So the corollary to what you're saying is that the Land Acquisition Amendment Ordinance does enough to facilitate industry and therefore make an Indian manufacturing. Yes, because what, what, what we've done is a lot of industries have been using these arguments, saying our land is costs too much <clears throat> to get subsidies from the government uh, and, and, and turn it into a taking issue, meaning Please help us. In see? other words, they're abusing the concept of expensive of land course. to actually get subsidies, yeah. and Mr. Modi mustn't encourage that. So I don't think he... I, the way I read the, the, the act was that he was saying, <clears throat> we must define the social purposes for which we take from minorities which are holding out. So you're happy <clears throat> with what he's done in terms of land? I think so. I, I think so. A second area where the Modi government has reformed, and it's done it to try and invite investment, and in particular foreign investment, is this pushed up FDI limits in insurance yes. and defense to 49. Right. Now, some people say the 49% in defense may not be sufficient for major Western defense manufacturers who have high-grade technology. They may not want to trust that technology to a joint venture in India they don't control. Will 49% be a deterrent or is it sufficient to invite them in because there's a guaranteed buyer, the government of India and the Indian Army and the Indian Defense Services? I, I think it's something we have to look at in the sense that I mean, it's like the Chinese used to do, have imports, import substituting investment. The Beijing Jeep was a great example. They got the Jeep people to come in. They wanted the Jeep people to produce for the Chinese army. And they pulled out because they were not willing to transfer the technology that way. Uh, Precisely I, the problem I'm hinting at exactly, here. Exactly, exactly. Will, will 
major western manufacturers of defense equipment transfer technology to a company they only have 49 percent control of yeah but I, I think 49 is not i mean what you can control doesn't require 51 uh, because so 49 is not a deterrent i don't think so I so don't here think again you believe mr modi has done enough to entice western manufacturers of defense but whether in fact they will come depends on whether they're willing to take the risk of transfer of technology by coming here. What will determine whether they're willing to take that risk or not? Uh, it, a lot will depend on basically uh, whether in fact the kind of technology they have can be stolen. I mean, look, there's an asymmetry mm. between pharmaceuticals, for example, and, uh, and the uh, uh, IT the, sector. Do we therefore you need see, tougher IPR laws to ensure that stealing doesn't happen? No, but I think you, you, you're using a word like stealing, which the Americans use in order you to get... You use the word stole. Huh? You use the word stole. Did I use the word stealing? You did. Stealing? I was only using your word. Uh, but okay. I mean, basically, if they no. want protection for their technology, would Mr. No, Modi this, signing this, on to IPR no, ensure but, they but come? But then I'll tell you what. That if they'll come in but with, with technology, which is behind the curve. So the latest technology mm. they won't give you, if they're worried so, well, about that. E so even but they will come and give you you know, yeah. so T e minus time minus one. So even after forty nine percent, we are still liable to get old technology rather than it depends, cutting edge. It depends on the industry in question and the technology. In so question. here, in fact, there are question marks that hang in the air, and it depends upon yes, who comes large and amount, what they but come there are with. Large amounts of technology, obsolete technology, which are available. Obsolete meaning one which they have gone beyond. Which but they we will could not give you the latest. Nobody gives you the latest. Uh, that's the exp experience everywhere. All right. I understand what you're saying. Right. There is going to be over here a series of question marks that hang in the air and they'd only be answered when the first lot of defense manufacturers come in and manufacture yeah. and you see what they're bringing or right. what they're not bringing. Right. Right. Let's come to the reforms that Mr. Modi has so far hesitated to push through. And I suppose the first of those is labor. Hmm. He's allowed Vasundra Raja Sindhya and the Rajasthan government to push through labor amendments. Right. He's written to chief ministers encouraging them to emulate the Rajasthan right, government. Right, right. But the central government has not done anything itself. Now, is that understandable or is it regrettable? No, I, I think this is a case where once you demonstrate the success of something which is being done in Rajasthan, it will diffuse because other people also are keen, other states, they're worried about, you know, what this They don't want to. Rajasthan to move ahead of them. What did he do himself? He went ahead on, on trade and direct foreign investment in Gujarat. Now he's trying to scale it up to the national level. But in the meantime, a lot of other states began to see, look, Gujarat has prospered. So in my opinion, what the prime minister is really He's reflecting his own experience like everybody does. And politics but he's is a also doing like something else and he's being politically wise rather than endanger the central government with possible uh, demonstrations and protests from unions by changing labor laws itself. He's letting individual states do it and that way you diffuse the problem but you could end up with the same result. That is in fact what he's planning in my opinion because that's the way it worked. In, in, in his case, and I think state decentralization is a way in which he's using uh, the ability of the system to throw up new innovative ideas. Like so this is political wisdom rather than weakness. Weakness. Right, exactly. Let's then come to a second reform, and this time it's one that you yourself have hinted at. Right. I won't put it more strongly than right. that. In a recent front page article in the Economic right. Times, you've clearly suggested right. that the government should drop its inhibition and accept FDI in multi-brand retail. Now, you right. know better than I right. that Mr. Modi and the BJP are actually committed to keeping I, FDI in multi-brand retail. Now, how can you convince him? Because he listens to you. How can you convince him that he needs to change his mind? I'll tell you why, because I think he doesn't need to change his mind in the sense of, you know, convictions. Going into retail, multi-brand multi retail, is part of the way he thinks. But he's a politician, and this is not, uh, I think, what will help him move when, into... When you say he's a politician, no, you mean he needs the opportune moment to do it? Exactly, and, and, but I also mean that he's going to have to see, he not challenge his constituency right out as soon as he comes So he can't power. do it immediately? Right, so I, just, it, I expect it will come down the road, but there's one additional... Well, when you say down the road, and I'm interrupting my apologies... Another year or so. 
As soon as that? Yes, I, I expect it. You Within can, a year or 18 months? You can grill me if it doesn't happen. But that actually would then because be a f- actual change of conviction too, because if it happened so quickly, it would suggest he's actually but done I a new turn in his thinking. I think his, con- his conviction is, in fact, uh, for having For multi-brand it's a, it's a political conviction on his part that he cannot do it. But how do you know his actual Because I've instinct- talked with him. And in his conversations, yes. he revealed his instincts. I was instincts. told not to raise the matter when I went and saw him for seven hours when he was in the last year of his chief minister. You're saying something very important, Professor Bhagwati. You're saying that actually from your conversations with the Prime Minister, yes. you know that his instinct it, is in favor of FDI and multi-brand it fits, retail. It fits in with the notion about foreign direct investment. He just but needs where, to be where it doesn't fit in is with the constituents. And one advantage for him is that this huge vote for him means that he's got a diversified constituency now. So he's not that dependent on the petty bourgeoisie. That would make it easier to go by his instinct. That makes it easier. Which is perhaps one reason why you believe in a year, year and a half, we could have FDI and multi-brand Because he'll feel a lot freer to take on this this traditional And and you're absolutely certain you haven't (laughs) misread or misunderstood the man. I can never be. (laughs) I mean, you can't be totally uncertain. But you're reasonably certain. But I was told not to raise the matter. And of course, we were just rapping, you know, Gujarati style, you know, we crack a joke and I put my hand out and it goes as a horizontal fives. And my, my brother was, he said we were doing it all, all through the two hours. And he was quite, quite frank and there was nothing. Really and that's when he clearly revealed that his instinct is for FDI in multi-brand retail. Yes, I'm, I, but I, I, politics could constrain him for a while. That is my. But not for very long. Yeah, because he was clearly in favor of direct foreign Let's investment. Come to something and this that fits he, into that. Let's come to something that he has done, which I believe is probably totally in sync with your own feelings, yes. and maybe it's even happened as a result of your advice. Right. The <laughs> abolition of the Planning Commission yes. and the creation of something called Niti Aayog in its right, place. Right. What do you believe Niti Aayog's principal focus, its principal policies, its principal direction should be? I think they should. You, you, you see, when the a nuclear explosion happened. Uh, I was asked to talk about it because I, you know, and uh, I personally thought it was not a bad idea mm. uh, that we should stand. I mean, I don't know whether I would have voted for it right away. Uh, but you jump back time. to 98 but, now. Yeah, so, so I was, I had just come in after talking to the plan, to Jaswan Singh in the planning commission. And somebody from the floor asked me, uh, there was a big crowd saying, what do you think of the this 10th five-year plan or whatever it was? And I said, that's strange because I don't even know what five, five, five-year plan we are on. <laughs> this focus had shifted already well, five to year policy, plan- policies rather than True. numbers. And five-year plans are not going to, I presume, ever happen again. So what do you think should be the principal I, focus and role of Niti Aayog? I think they will have to be looking at policies systematically. Like, for instance, retail sector, all right, which we have been discussing. They should be able to assess all the different arguments which have been assembled on, on both sides of the issue. So the Prime Minister gets a, a reasonably objective, competent view of whether it's good or bad. He's chosen as the Vice Chairman, a yes. colleague of yours, Avin yes. Panagria, a yes. man who's known to be very much in favor of reforms, a man who's almost impatient in wanting them yesterday rather than right. day after right. tomorrow. Right. Do you think this is an indication that Mr. Modi wants someone behind him, pushing him in the direction of reforms, so that his own instincts are backed up by good research and good thinking yes, by people like but, Panagria? But the, the best politicians actually choose advisors who consonant with their own... Absolutely. <laughs> they choose I advisors mean, like, who push them down the like road they Rajiv want to be Gandhi pushed. Like when Rajiv Gandhi got adopted, became the Prime Minister, there was some talk about my becoming his advisor, which would have made sense except I couldn't have come. But you're saying a very important but, thing. You're saying good politicians choose advisors who push them in the direction they want to be pushed. Push them in the direction actually are supportive in terms of analysis, etc. Because you, you have to be able to go into the polit- political space and then be able to argue for your convictions. Now, all of this makes a lot of sense. It has a conceptual whole world view, sort of welching right, shang around right, it. Right. When people then look at something else that's happening, they worry, they say, side by side, there are these wretched love jihad campaigns being waged in UP. I know. There's a conversion happening in different parts of the country with members of the RSS or right, allies of the right. BJP, even MPs of the BJP involved. And then there's this silly, petty idea of converting Christmas into Good Governance Day and seemingly slighting all Christians. 
Does it worry you that this is sending out a contradictory message? Yes, and this is why, and then I think in a interview in the Hindustan Times, uh, which came out yesterday, I think, uh, I said that the, he should not wait. He needs to come out and really attack this sort of thing because it could accumulate uh, and it could create the wrong impression. Now, I don't think it is that bad. I mean, but I it have, could become worse. But it could become worse. He's got to anticipate. You see, right now, if you ask me, I'm not convinced that the country's in ferment over this. I mean, I'm reminded of a cartoon in Punch where there are two nomads sitting in the desert, you know, quietly, uh, and then reading Al Aram from Cairo and saying, it says we are in ferment. <laughs> <laughs> now, right. But leaving that but, aside, but, but, leaving that aside. Let me aside, raise two quick questions with you. What image and impression has it created outside India? Has it worried investors in America, in Europe? I don't think so. No. No. You're no. confident of that? A hundred percent. The second question. The only thing is that magazines like The Economist uh, have been doing retire. I mean, they, I mean, once I wrote to the editor, I said, you should abolish your writing on politics and stick to economics where you write pretty well, <laughs> meaning they approve of what I write. What about my, my second question? And that's this. Do you think Mr. Modi's silence huh. is actually an indication that he's quite happy for this to happen? Because many people worry his silence may be a form of acceptance, that this may be something he doesn't disagree with, he can't outrightly support it in public, but he's happy for it to carry on, which is why but he lets RSS allies, his own MPs, carry on saying silly but things. But didn't, he, didn't you yesterday take, take on and, and, uh, that guy? Shakshi Maharaj? Yeah. Well, the party president did, but after a fairly long while. Yes, but it's not such a long while. I mean, look, uh, I, I, I'm, I've been a Congress supporter all my life, except very recently. Uh, I mean, right now, I'm an in, independent. Most of the people I know in Congress were worried about the Stalinists, in, 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 not in Kerala, but in Bengal. But they were part of your allies. And you so see? they said nothing about and it. And so they, they didn't bring themselves to be Is able that what to you're say suggesting? It. That when Mr. So, are you suggesting that when Mr. Modi's allies, and sometimes his own MPs, yes. say and do ridiculous things, even potentially inflammatory things, it's difficult for Mr. Modi to publicly tick them off, but behind the scenes and behind closed doors. But that's is. what he seems to be doing from what I hear. But I think he's got to come out publicly, in my opinion. Also. You do think so? Oh, yeah. A definitely. formal but public said statement. So. Yeah, just taking them to task and saying this is absurd. Like, you know, we should have... What uh, happens if he does We are worried about population explosion because of the Muslims multiplying. But somebody, I mean, this is where uh, Panagari, etc. can help. He can go to the public policy space, the prime minister, and say, look, there's every evidence around the, around the world that when people prosper, which is what his idea is, that Muslims will also prosper as a result of growth, the women themselves will not want to become you know, manufacturers of babies. You're confident that people like Mr. Panagria or others will in fact advise Mr. Modi to speak out and Mr. Modi will. You've Absolutely. known the man, and this has to be my last question. Absolutely. You've known the man, you've met him, you've understood him. He's done, as you call them, horizontal fives with you. Do you believe instinctively that he would be averse to this nonsense of conversion? Absolutely. and Because there's no, you see, one thing we don't realize is that uh, when you look at books on Dalits and the blacks in America, like Gyan Pandey's, both were oppressed. One thing we keep forgetting, and this is where we need to really address the issue in a much more sophisticated way, is that Muslims ruled India. So part of the problem is the fact that there are memories of people like Aurangzeb, which are through the system, to they've lost a privileged position. So to, that to, readjustment is always difficult. No, it's difficult, and therefore what I'm saying is, if I, I if I was a sociologist, I would commission sociologists and historians to study that. Is Otherwise, this, how do we address the issue effectively? My last question: You're bound to meet Mr. Modi during this visit yes, to India. Yes. If you do, will you say to him, as you're saying to me, as you said to the Hindustan oh, Times, you need to speak out, you need to be heard? Absolutely. That's the promise. Absolutely. I, I promise to do that, and I do it in public because one of the things is. <laughs> when I was for the 91 reforms, 
We were completely marginalized, and you know, we were reactionaries, and but we were this CIA time, Mr. agents. Modi, didn't bother me. This time, Mr. Modi knows you, trusts you. As I said in my introduction, he's inspired yeah. by you. So if you fulfill your promise and you tell him to speak out, chances right. are he will. And I think uh, it's something he would be willing to listen to, absolutely. Professor? And I, I just don't see any, any real venom against other communities okay. and so on in him. I hope you're right. Professor Bhagwati, a pleasure talking to you. Nice to talk to you too.